Welcome along fellow time travelers and strange historians. This time around we're going to travel back in time to check out some of my favorite images of John Lennon at his home in the Dakota apartment building in New York City. You're going to see some really cool images, some of which you may have never seen before. Before I begin, please like and share the show and subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell. Now please join me around the campfire. This is the legendary Dakota apartment building located on the Upper West Side of New York City. Now for those who are not familiar with Manhattan, the Upper West Side is the area to the west of Central Park and it is easily one of the most expensive places to live in New York City and even in the world. So it's not like there were bunches of gang members prowling around as if it were a scene out of West Side Story. Though there were some bad areas including what was once referred to as Needle Park, not too far away. But beyond that, the area on and around Central Park West and West 72nd Street was, and is really beautiful, with amazing buildings that always attracted rich and famous people like John Lennon. And as a result, we have a collection of images of John Lennon that were taken outside of the Dakota as he would come and go through the main entryway. The fascinating thing about these images is the sheer fact that you could see him walking on the streets like a normal person. What's also fascinating is that, prior to moving to New York City, John Lennon was one of the most photographed men in history. And then it all sort of stopped. He and Yoko Ono no longer had professional filmmakers following them around anymore. Or if they did, we haven't seen any of that. And so we really don't have that many photographs of John Lennon at this particular time in his life, which clearly was by his choice. No doubt you've seen this image of John and Yoko with the Dakota behind them, as well as this one that was taken on the same day. This is them standing in front of the Dakota's entry. And we have images of John signing autographs for fans. And there are some images of John Lennon getting in and out of limousines and other types of vehicles in front of the Dakota. And the photographs show how much John changed over the course of time, mostly with his hair going from short to long and then long to short as he aged. And there are some images of John and Sean. Now since these images were taken in the 1970s mostly by amateurs, for the most part the images are kind of grainy and kind of dark. But we take what we can get, right? And there are some images of John at night, especially towards the end of 1980, when he was going to and from the recording studio. This is a great image of John and Paul Gorish, and his story has been told a bunch of times. I was friends with Paul, he was a really interesting guy. As you may know, Paul was an amateur photographer who became friendly with John Lennon in a rather unusual way, by first posing as a repairman in order to get close to John Lennon. Yeah, I know, it sounds kind of creepy. And that, of course, could have gone very badly for John Lennon, if Paul Gorich was anything other than a loyal fan in awe of his hero. And no matter what you think of their relationship and how it began, clearly John liked him, because he used this image for a cover for one of his singles. Imagine being Paul, Imagine being a fan. Imagine being friendly with John Lennon. And he tells you to be outside the Dakota at a certain period in time. And to take photographs of him and Yoko leaving the building. And then he chooses one of your photographs to be immortalized forever on the cover of one of his singles. That had to be pretty cool for Paul. This is an unusual image that was taken from inside the entryway to the Dakota. I could be wrong, but it seems to me that John and Yoko probably did not know that this image was being taken. And we have this great snap taken by photographer Roger Farrington. This, of course, was a coordinated photo shoot. This is an interesting image because it shows that a vehicle could indeed fit into the entryway of the Dakota, even though the building was built between 1880 and 1884, and it was originally designed for pedestrians and for horse-drawn carriages to be able to pass through into the courtyard where they would turn around 
and then pass through again back onto West 72nd Street. Some people find this image kind of upsetting to see because it makes you wonder what would have happened or not happened on December 8, 1980 if the limousine that brought John and Yoko home that night would have simply pulled into the entryway as this one had. In fact, this is an image that I took. It shows the back entryway that John Lennon used to walk through when there were too many fans outside. And some people think that maybe he should have used that more often. Here's a great series of images that show John getting out at the curb of the Dakota and sadly being fully exposed without any bodyguards or any protection at all. All things considered, it's pretty amazing that anyone could have gotten that close to John Lennon. This would be like fans being on the lawn of Graceland. I can't imagine Elvis would have tolerated that for too long. But for whatever reason, this is the way that John chose to live towards the end of his life. I read many comments where people, probably like you, said that one of the many reasons they loved John was that he was making every effort to just live like a regular person. But the thing is, John Lennon was never like us, was he? I mean, he was one of the wealthiest and most famous entertainers in the world. And unfortunately, that made him a target for weirdos, especially one in particular. And that is why Paul Gorish made probably a zillion dollars when media around the world licensed this image that Paul took of John signing an autograph outside of the Dakota on December 8, 1980. Don't worry, I'm not going to show the person he's signing the autograph for. I don't do that. But you already know that it was the loser who murdered John Lennon hours after this image was taken. And it's because of that tragic event that we have this image of Yoko Ono, all alone, without her husband, standing in front of the gates of the Dakota. But hey, you already know all of this stuff, so let's lighten things up and go inside of the building and check out where and how John Lennon actually lived. This is a vintage floor plan of the Dakota, and those arrows point to the entryway where John used to walk in and out of the building. And as you can see, it goes right through to the courtyard. And that's because, as I previously mentioned, horse-drawn carriages would drop off the residence or guests, and they'd go into the courtyard and turn completely around, and then they would leave, and then they may or may not have gone to local stables nearby. And on the east side of the entryway is the office, where John and other residents could go in there and grab their mail and packages and check messages. A lot of people have been misled to think that the Dakota is like some sort of hotel, with a big lobby inside. And that's mainly because they read stories about John getting shot and then opening up a door, walking up a flight of steps, opening up another door, and then going into something called a lobby. But those stories probably should have been fact-checked. Because for the most part, it's really nothing more than a security office. Because if you ever need to visit anyone at the Dakota, as I have, you must go into that office and let them know who you are and where you're going. If not, let me tell you, you're not going to get very far. Trust me when I tell you this. There are cameras and Dakota personnel everywhere, as there should be. And so John Lennon would pass through the entryway and then enter the courtyard. And then he would turn right and he would walk to the southeast quadrant of the courtyard. This vintage illustration from the 1880s shows the Port Crochet, the entryway, that leads to West 72nd Street. And this is the view that John would have seen when passing through that entryway and entering the massive courtyard. And this shows the north side of that space. I really like this image because it shows the beauty of the buff yellow brick. And so for those who are watching who are big fans of Rosemary's Baby, and I know there are many, who strangely think that the Dakota is haunted or spooky or creepy or dark or dreary, I think maybe they've seen way too many images of the Dakota as it looked in the 1960s and 1970s, when the exterior was covered in city soot. Because the Dakota is actually a very beautiful and cheerful looking building. And this image of the courtyard proves just that. Remember, the courtyard never was covered in all the city soot and dirt and grime that the exterior of the building was. Now on the far end, you can see an opening that once led out to West 73rd Street. You see, the original intention was that that would be used for a staff in the 1800s and beyond. But the thing is, that never happened. And so those gates along West 73rd Street have been closed for quite some time. You see those doors right there in the center? Those lead to the service elevators and staircases for staff and deliveries. 
and you can see those massive, beautiful fountains in the courtyard. This is the view that John would have seen when leaving the lobby in the southeast quadrant. And that apartment right there is where comedic actress Gilda Radner lived. Many of the apartments in that corner were subdivided over the course of time. And so for Gilda to be able to access her home, she needed to walk up that iron staircase, and then she would turn right to that door that was added. And to the right was her kitchen, and then you had a living space, and then the bedrooms were towards the back. Eventually, that apartment was purchased by football legend John Madden. And so, yeah, this is what John saw as he was leaving the Dakota and was about to turn left to walk towards West 72nd Street. But when he came home, he would pass through the first set of gates, go through the entryway, pass through a second set of gates, turn right, and walk towards the entry to the lobby in the southeast quadrant of the Dakota. And so what you're looking at right now is what John would have seen on his way home. Those hours show the windows to the apartment that John and Yoko purchased in the 1970s for the use of their offices. They called it Studio One. Check out that awesome staircase. Along the bottom you can see glass blocks. Those were originally designed and placed there in order to allow sunlight to be able to penetrate through them and down into the basement. Since as you know, when the Dakota was being built in 1880, Thomas Edison had not yet had electric generators. Those didn't get rolling until 1882. So John and Yoko would walk up those steps and they would pass through those massive doors and enter their lobby. This fantastic photo was shared on social media by a very kind and smart gentleman named Elliot Mintz. You should follow him on Facebook and check out his website where he's got all sorts of amazing interviews. And as you may know, he was a great friend of John and, as of the time of this recording, is a great and loyal friend of Yoko. This photo shows the lobby where John and Yoko would pass through on their way to and from their residence and to the office. Out of frame to the left is the elevator that they would go up to the seventh floor in order to go home. Now, of course, it's unlikely that John and Yoko ever walked up seven flights of steps to get up to their apartment, but no doubt some residents did use those stairs. And if and when they did, this image shows that incredible staircase that they would have followed during the journey up and down the steps. But of course, John and Yoko did not have to go up those steps to go home or to their office. Instead, when they entered the lobby, they would have turned left, and they would have walked up those steps right there. And they would have gone straight ahead, and then they would have turned right to go into a hallway on the ground floor along the east side of the building. And this layout shows that opening. This is one of the rooms of that apartment. That painting right there shows John and Sean during the summer of 1980 while they were vacationing in the Bahamas. And here we see one of John Lennon's many pianos. This image taken by Bob Gruen shows John and Yoko at the piano. As of the time of this recording, this image has been making the rounds around the internet because it shows a cassette player, which may or may not have been the one used to record the home demos of songs like Real Love, Free as a Bird, and Now and Then that Yoko later gave to Paul and George and Ringo to finish. And here we have another image of John Lennon in 1980 playing that same black piano. This is a cool image that shows Yoko at an incredible Egyptian-style desk, which was located in the same room as that black piano. And check out those huge mirrors on the wall. And you can see that that window overlooks the courtyard. This image and the following ones were taken while John and Yoko and Sean were seated on sofas to the side where the Egyptian desk was, and probably still is. By the way, legend has it that when they first acquired this apartment, John and Yoko purchased an entire tea house from Japan, and they had it shipped to the USA in order to have it rebuilt in that apartment. But then they realized it didn't fit, so they sent it back. 
I'm sure that annoys a lot of the carpenters who are listening right now, because you know the rule. Measure twice, cut once. These are some great images that show John and Yoko in the other room of that apartment. And you can see an entire wall of filing cabinets. And one could only wonder if they're still there, or if all the paperwork in there has been digitized. What do you think? Now let's go check out John and Yoko's apartment on the seventh floor. As mentioned previously, they would have passed through this lobby, and they would have turned right. They then would have gotten into the elevator right there, and then they would have gone up to the seventh floor, and they would have walked straight ahead and passed through those doors to enter the hallway to their massive apartment, which, by the way, they purchased from actor Robert Ryan. Now, I know a lot of people listening have no idea who Robert Ryan was. Well, he was an American actor, and he was known for his really powerful performances in film and on stage. His film career really took off in the 1940s, and he became known for his versatile acting skills. He often played intense and complex characters. And of course, he had this distinctive, rugged appearance and a deep, commanding voice that added to his on-screen presence. If you ever get the chance, check out some of Robert Ryan's work. You'll be very impressed. Now, I understand that floor plans can be difficult for people to understand who aren't used to looking at them. And so the first thing I want to say is that for the benefit of their privacy and security, this floor plan does not perfectly reflect how this space may look today. You see, just like many other apartments in the Dakota, walls have gone up, walls have come down. Bathrooms were added, and bathrooms were removed, and sometimes even entire fireplaces were removed. And the shape and configurations of many rooms have altered over the course of time. Also, sometimes apartments have been sliced and diced and subdivided, especially following the co-op conversion. And so the original layouts of the apartments have changed over time. And so some apartments today have less or more rooms than they originally did. And of course, many rooms have been repurposed from their original uses. But this does give you a pretty good general idea of their apartment's layout. And so one good word that could be used to describe these rooms will be to call them chambers, because they could be used for different reasons, and they most certainly have. But for the most part, we could say that that chamber is a bedroom, and that chamber is also a bedroom, and that chamber is a living room, and that chamber is a library. And that chamber can be used as a public space or a bedroom. The same with that chamber right there. And jumping to the other side, that chamber is a dining room. And that large series of rooms right there is the kitchen area. Once upon a time, those individual rooms were used for such things as staff rooms, a butler's pantry, and a bathroom, and storage. And perhaps even a small living space for staff. Right next to the kitchen is a door that leads to a platform to access the service stairs and the service elevators. Now look, I do not want to be the weirdo who reveals the exact layout of John Lennon's apartment. But let's just say that some people think that apartment number 72 includes that chamber right there. And some people think it doesn't. I will say this. That chamber was originally part of the apartment to the north. And it would be rather unusual for anyone, no matter who they are, to knock on their neighbor's door and instead of asking for a cup of sugar to say, hey, would you mind selling me your bedroom? But then again, stranger things have happened at the Dakota. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. Before I continue, can you please do me a favor and like and share the show? And kindly subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell. This is a 3D rendering of the apartment that, once again, is not intended to be 100% accurate. So cool your jets about that. It simply exists to give you a general idea of the layout of their space. And so you've got the living room, and you've got the library, you've got another chamber, and you have another chamber, and there may or may not have been another chamber further to the north, and there's the kitchen space, and there is the dining room, and the large vestibule between two doors that leads to the main entryway. And you've got one bedroom, and you have another bedroom. By the way, this was John Lennon's bedroom, and Sean's bedroom faced Central Park. And I assume that was because it was closer to the kitchen, and it was probably easier for Sean's nanny to be able to go back and forth in that area. But if you lived in this apartment, 
Which chamber would you have used for your bedroom? One facing Central Park or one facing West 72nd Street? Kindly let me know in the comments below. Now let's check out some of the images that show John Lennon's apartment. As we know, most of the space overlooks Central Park West. And for those who are not familiar with New York City, those trees in the foreground are in Central Park. And those buildings are on the Upper East Side on the other side of the park. And here we see John Lennon sitting in one of the windowsills. And this image shows Yoko seated in one of the floor-to-ceiling windows with a wrought iron railing on the other side. This photo was taken in 1973, soon after they acquired the apartment. And so you can see it had not yet been furnished or decorated in any way. And we see Yoko seated in one of the windowsills. And we have another image of her seated on the floor. And here's another one of her in front of one of the windows. This image was taken in the living room on the southeast corner. And we can see Yoko looking out the window facing Central Park. And you can see John's white piano in the corner. And here we see Yoko in the same room, looking out that same window many decades later. This is perhaps one of the most famous images of John and Yoko. Sadly, it was taken five hours before John was murdered. They posed on the floor in one of the chambers, probably to the left of that sofa. The photographer was Annie Leibovitz, and this image is a Polaroid. And here we see John seated in a chair that matches that sofa. Many of us know that John loved jukeboxes. And so, of course, he had one in his Dakota apartment. It seems to have been located in that particular chamber right there. And here are some images of John posing in a rather unusual way. But once again, we take what we can get. Alrighty, let's check out the kitchen. This is where John spent a lot of his time. Now just so you know, John and Yoko had this entire space enlarged by bringing down those walls. And they had it made into a large living space that of course included the original kitchen. And so we have these snaps of John and Yoko soon after moving into their apartment. This image was taken soon after some renovations. And you can look out that window and look into the apartment on the other side of the courtyard, which no doubt means that the people in that apartment could look in and watch John and Yoko inside their kitchen. But hey, that's just part of living in New York City or really any major city. Sometimes you're just gonna have neighbors that could look right into your apartment. And some people care and some people don't care.
Here is a rare image that shows John Lennon's first son, Julian, visiting his dad. I think that Julian only visited his father a couple of times after John and Yoko left England. He visited him at least one time in California and at least one time there at the Dakota. Who knows what the future would have held for father and son had John not been murdered when Julian was 17 years old. Which was even more unusual when one considers that John's mother, Julia, tragically died in the street when John was 17 years old. I have read that one of the reasons why Sean and Julian do not have children is because they were afraid that this cycle would continue. And for all those who thought that John baking bread was a myth, here we actually have some proof that he did. Well, at least one time. And so we can see John spending some time in his kitchen, actually cooking for himself and Sean. And here we see John and Yoko and Sean in the kitchen. And this image shows John feeding Sean. This is both a happy and sad image at the same time. You see, it was taken on October 9th of 1980, which was John Lennon's birthday. It was also Sean Lennon's birthday. And this would be the last birthday that they would ever spend together because John would be murdered almost exactly two months later on December 8th, 1980. As many John Lennon fans know, the number nine seemed to follow John Lennon around throughout his life with many unusual coincidences. And even though John died on December 8th in New York City, it was December 9th in England. This image shows Sean and, I believe, either the son or the grandson of his nanny in the kitchen. And you can see how the space was expanded for a living space, with sofas and a table and quite a large plant. This is another image taken of Sean, and I believe that's his nanny to the right, and I believe that's either her son or maybe her grandson to the left. The following images were taken of John in the 1970s while he was seated in his kitchen. And here we see John and Sean. And here we have a relatively contemporary image of Yoko seated in the kitchen with the large window that overlooks the courtyard behind her. Here we have some images of John and Yoko and Sean when he was newly born. These great photos were taken by photographer Bob Gruen. And this image was taken of Yoko and Sean in the 1980s at the White Piano. And here's another image of Yoko seated at that White Piano. And that's the window that she was looking out upon in previous images.
And then we have a series of images of Yoko while she was seated on the large white sofa in the living room. And here we have another image of Yoko. And this is a sad image to see. Once again, as many of you know, I do not believe in looking at photographs of complete strangers, or anybody for that matter, and trying to read their inner thoughts. But we see an image like this of Yoko, and we could just imagine the amount of sadness that was brewing within her at that time. Yeah, it's sad to say. Look, nobody wants to lose somebody that they love, right? But we all have. And of course, there's no good way to lose anyone. But the way that she lost her husband, the way he bled to death right in front of her eyes, no doubt that must have been unbearable. She must have been filled to the brim, probably still is, with unending sadness as a result of the horrific imagery that filled her mind. Honestly, an emotionally and mentally weaker person would probably have completely fallen to pieces. How do you think you would have handled moving on after witnessing what Yoko did? You know, millions of people dislike Yoko for all kinds of weird reasons, but at any point did you, or do you, extend any sympathy to her for what she had to endure? Kindly let me know in the comments below. There's a great image of Yoko seated at the piano, and the window to the right overlooks West 72nd Street. There's a great photo of Yoko taken probably in 1973, standing on the balcony overlooking West 72nd Street. Central Park and the Upper East Side can be seen behind her. And here's another image of Yoko at the white piano. And we have additional images of her seated on the white sofa in the living room. I was really excited the first time I saw this photo. I really love it. It shows Yoko standing in the doorway between two rooms that overlook Central Park. I don't know how tall Yoko is, I think she's maybe 5 foot 2 inches, but this image gives a general idea of the enormous height of the ceilings in that apartment, which are 12 feet in height by the way. Some of you may know that John and Yoko took a trip to Egypt, but it was not for a casual vacation. You see, John and Yoko shared a deep interest in ancient Egypt. I read somewhere they supposedly viewed themselves as reincarnations of Egyptian royalty. But I have no idea if that's really true or not. But check this out. In January of 1977, a gentleman who was working for them got wind of an archaeological excavation in Egypt that was aiming to uncover an ancient temple. But the project lacked the necessary funds for completion. And so upon learning of this, Yoko wired the needed money directly to Cairo. And then John and Yoko made plans to visit the excavation site because they were eager to acquire some of the archaeological treasures. During an interview in September of 1980, Yoko said the following, quote, To make money, you have to spend money. But if you're going to make money, you have to make it with love. I love Egyptian art. I make sure to get all the Egyptian things, not for their value, but for their magic power. Each piece has a certain magic power. End quote. What do you think? Do you agree with that? Do you think that ancient artifacts possess magic power? And if so, would you love to have any in your home? Clearly John and Yoko did. Because when you see images like this, you can be assured that those are real Egyptian artifacts behind her. And here we have Yoko looking out one of the many large windows overlooking Central Park. 
And here we have John seated upon a black sofa in the 1970s, wearing some cool-looking shoes. If you were alive in the 1970s and wore shoes like that, or platform shoes, or anything of the sort, please let me know in the comments below, because I think that's pretty cool. The following images were taken of Yoko inside their apartment during or perhaps slightly after the 1980s. As you know, the Dakota has always been filled with rich and famous residents. And one of John and Yoko's most famous neighbors was singer Roberta Flack. She owned the apartment located on the southwest side of the seventh floor of the building, located right there. Although her apartment did not include the chamber with the windows facing the west side. And this floor plan shows her apartment. At the end of her hallway, she had access to a service elevator. And in that area was a door that was always locked, or at least I think it was always locked, because it led to apartment number 71, which was purchased by John and Yoko not too long after they purchased apartment number 72. As you can see, that apartment has six chambers, including bedrooms and a bathroom and a kitchen. One of the fascinating things about the Dakota is the incredible amount of privacy that it affords the residents. And so for the most part, each quadrant has doors that only lead to two apartments. And so when John and Yoko first moved to the Dakota, they would walk straight ahead to get into their apartment and someone else shared that platform with them, and they would turn right in order to enter their apartment. And clearly at some point, John and Yoko purchased it. Perhaps they just knocked on their door one day and made them an offer they couldn't refuse. My question to you is this. If you own both of those apartments, how would you access your second apartment? Would you go out your main door, and then enter a public hallway, and then pass through the main door going into your other apartment, or would you knock that wall down, or at least create an opening, to be able to go through? Kindly let me know in the comments below. If you view the Dakota from the other side of West 72nd Street and across, you can see the windows to apartment number 71. And looking up from below, those arrows show all the windows for the apartments owned by John and Yoko. As you may know, some people are under the bizarre belief that John and Yoko own the entire southeast side of the building, with all the space located within the gables. But that simply was never true. Unfortunately, way too many people believe everything they see and read on the internet. But thankfully you're watching this, so you're getting all the true facts. And here are some cool images taken of Yoko inside apartment number 71 that overlooks West 72nd Street. This photo shows Yoko in front of a large table in apartment number 71. Looking below the table, you can see all the different paints and the supplies that she would use while working there. Now let's check out some cool images of Sean Lennon. Let's be honest, shall we? Sean Lennon is one of the most famous rich kids in American history. Can you imagine being him? Imagine your dad was John Lennon. And over the course of your entire life, you had an endless stream of money while growing up. And you lived in multiple beautiful apartments and mansions. That had to be pretty cool, right? And imagine growing up in the Dakota with incredibly rich and famous neighbors like Lauren Bacall and Leonard Bernstein. Check out these images that were taken at Sean Lennon's ninth birthday party in 1984. You see that guy right there? You know how that is, don't you? That is Steve Jobs. But it gets even better. Look to the right. That is the gift that Steve Jobs gave to Sean Lennon. It was an Apple Macintosh. 128K computer. Before most people in the world even knew what an Apple computer was, Sean got one as a gift, personally, from Steve Jobs. At the time, I believe it sold for $2,495, which is the equivalent of well over $7,000 at the time of this recording. But it gets even better. You see that gentleman all the way to the right? Who do you think that was? That was Andy Warhol. And we could also see that artist Keith Haring was there. 
If you had guests like that, and you got gifts like that on your ninth birthday, please let me know in the comments below. Because all of that is pretty cool. And here we see Sean in his bedroom many years later. Can you imagine how tall a bedroom ceiling must be in order to have a gigantic stuffed giraffe inside of it? And so yeah, Sean Lennon has had a pretty cool life by all accounts. He's also quite handsome and talented and creative and a very intelligent man. But of course, it must have been dreadful to grow up as he did without having his father around. But everything seems to have worked out for him. In fact, if there's anybody who feels sorry for him for any reason, you could probably put those feelings aside right about now. After all, this image shows Sean and his incredibly beautiful and talented girlfriend. This is a great image taken by Bob Gruen of John and Yoko and Sean in John and Yoko's bedroom. And here is an image of John and Sean in one of the bathrooms. And here we have John and Sean and Julian posing for a photo holding guitars. Imagine what kind of musical group that could have turned out to be. Here we have another sad photo which shows Yoko in her bed with Sean sleeping beside her. Right about now, many of you may be saying, hey, wait a minute, that doesn't look like the bed or the bedroom that you just showed John and Yoko in. Yeah, there's a reason for that. I'm pretty sure I read that after John died, Yoko did not want to sleep in their bedroom anymore. I'm sure many people can relate to that. I mean, have you ever lost somebody that you loved, that you slept with, and you wondered how in the world you could ever climb into your own bed again. Because you kind of expect to see them, right? One night they're there, and then one night they're not there anymore. So yeah, I think she started sleeping in one of the other bedrooms. Not that that made falling asleep any easier, but sleeping in the same bed, in the same room that she shared with her husband, that probably would have made it impossible to fall asleep. Thankfully, she had plenty of other rooms where she could sleep. In fact, here's a photo of one of her many bedrooms. And here's some more images of Yoko and Sean. This is an image of Yoko taking a photo of this particular image, which shows a glass half full and the glasses that John was wearing on the night that he was assassinated. And you can see the dried blood on one of the lenses. I'm going to ask you a question. If your husband or a wife was violently murdered in front of you and you got their eyeglasses and they were covered in dried blood, do you think you could ever look at them ever again? Do you think you could ever touch them? Do you think you could display them on a table and take a photograph of them? Yoko Ono is a conceptual artist, and so the photograph itself is meant to stir up emotions and provoke thoughts in the viewer. So what do you think when you see an image like this of John Lennon's blood-covered glasses? Kindly let me know in the comments below. This is a photo that was taken by Sean Lennon that he shared on social media. That is a performer known as Lady Gaga, and she is playing John Lennon's white piano. And here are some images from the private collection of Elliot Mintz, who kindly shared them on social media. They were taken during one of Yoko's birthday parties. In fact, I believe it was this particular party where Yoko was personally given some of my books about the Dakota and Tinner's Park, which you are welcome to buy from your favorite bookseller. This photo shows Elliot Mintz on the left, Cindy Lauper in the center, and Sean Lennon on the right.
This photo shows Elliot and Sean at the white piano. And this one shows Elliot and photographer Bob Gruen. Now let's head up to the roof. To get there, John would have taken the stairs or the elevator up to the 8th floor, and then he would have gone up a set of service stairs to get to the 9th floor, and then another set of service stairs to access the roof. And that is where a whole bunch of really incredible images were taken of him. I think they're amazing. They were taken along the east side of the roof and along one of the central gables. During that photo shoot, images were taken of John Lennon inside of Ward Bennett's contemporary apartment, located within the pyramidal structure on the east side of the roof. If you've not yet seen my show on that apartment, you may enjoy checking it out. Sharing these particular images seems like the best way to end this particular show, because it shows a happy time in John Lennon's life and shows that the Dakota apartment building is not only the place where John Lennon was tragically murdered, but it was also the place where John Lennon lived. The Dakota is where he laughed, where he wrote music, where he wrote songs, and where he created and shared countless priceless memories with his friends and family. So when you think of the Dakota apartment building and you think of John Lennon, remember to think about the happy times that he spent there. Focusing on the happy times in John Lennon's life, rather than the tragedy of his death, is the best way to celebrate his legacy and appreciate his contributions, and remember him for the positive impact that he had in the world. John Lennon left behind a rich legacy as a musician, artist, and advocate for peace. Remembering the happy times allows you to celebrate his accomplishments and the positive influence that he had on music and pop culture. Look, everyone has their own way of remembering and honoring John Lennon. And so it's entirely valid for us to focus on the aspects that still bring joy and appreciation for his contributions to the world. And so I'm doing my part by celebrating his life and memory with a handful of images that I was able to gather that show John Lennon at home in the Dakota. And you are doing your part by watching this and listening to this and learning because as I always say, there is so much more to the Dakota's history than that John Lennon died there and Rosemary's Baby. And it is while learning about its fascinating architecture and incredible history that you can garner a new appreciation for why John Lennon loved living at the Dakota. So, what do you think of John Lennon's life at this world-famous building? If you were rolling in dough, would you have loved to have been John Lennon's neighbor? By the way, I do not know who took some of the images that I have shown in this show. So, if you see that I missed anybody, will you kindly let me know so I can respectfully give them the credit that they deserve? At this point, I'd like to thank you for joining me on this time travel adventure. 
to check out some of my favorite images of John Lennon at home in the Dakota. Kindly remember to like, share, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell, because there will be more videos like this one, and I hope you'll check those out too. Please check out the links below to learn how to support my research and productions. Specifically, I'd really appreciate it if you could become a member of my channel and or join me on Patreon. You could also leave a super thanks in the comments below. Kindly be kind to all non-human animals and please don't eat them. They don't like that. Remember, for the benefit of compassion for all living things and their own health, all of the beetles at some point chose a plant-based diet. And please do yourself a favor and go to a local shelter and adopt a cat or a dog or both. You and they will be very glad that you did. Until next time, I wish you safe travels on all your journeys.